Hello and welcome to another online learning day, another topic in chemistry as we continue to explore and understand more about atoms connecting to other atoms and building pieces of matter. So our essential questions we're going to talk about today is why does that happen? Why do atoms combine to form what we call compounds and what's the difference between those bonds that hold those compounds together and we're going to talk about something called an oxidation number. Those are the things that are going to guide our learning for today. Go ahead and set up your focus notes. So the topic you could call is why atoms combine. If you're doing this, no, these notes on the day that I assign them, it is 1223. Otherwise, write down whatever date it is that you're seeing these notes. And then at the top of your focus notes page, go ahead and set up those same essential questions we just talked about. But now you're going to actually write them down. Why do atoms combine to form compounds? We're going to answer that question because that's what explains why we have compounds. Why isn't everything just an element? Um, that's going to be a big deal. Also, when atoms form compounds, they need to attach to each other, and those are called bonds. There's an ionic bond and a covalent bond, and they are the difference between them has to do with electrons. So that's your second essential question. What is the difference between ionic and covalent bonds in terms of electrons? And the third one, what is an oxidation number? It turns out that oxidation number is something that's really important when you need to start thinking about um, why certain atoms combine with other, certain atoms and not others. And we also need to use oxidation numbers to predict what makes some atoms more stable than others or more reactive than others and putting things together in certain combinations. All of that is understood by oxidation numbers. All right, pause the video if you need to finish writing your essential questions. Otherwise, let's get into it. Why do atoms combine? That's our first question. Let's make sure we answer that. It is about stability, being stable. Think about human nature. Human nature is just part of chemistry and we're made of atoms and we want to be stable. It's the same reason. There is something called the octet rule in chemistry that has to do with eight valence electrons. The octet rule says atoms want to have eight valence electrons in their electron cloud. If you think of the basic structure of an atom, you've got electrons flying around the nucleus and they're arranged in different levels. So valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. So if there's a nucleus, whatever energy level is farthest from the nucleus is the valence electron. So in hydrogen, there is just one level. So that is the valence electron. In oxygen, there's two levels. The ones on the outside are the valence electrons. Same with these nitrogens and carbon. We can get up to seven energy levels as far as what we know in chemistry so far, the elements that have been either discovered or created. Seven different energy levels. The farthest ones away are called the valence electrons. Okay, so if you have eight in that valence level, that makes the atom stable. Why eight? That's something we're going to talk more about when we have just more in-depth chemistry background. For now, I'm going to ask you to trust me that eight is the stable number. We'll learn why eight is special when we learn more about chemistry. All right. It turns out that there is one group on the periodic table that all the elements are trying to be like in terms of their valence electrons. They're not changing their identity. They're not turning into that atom. They're just copying their number of valence electrons. And that's the noble gases. So if you're looking at a periodic table, it is the far right only column. Not all the gases, just these on the far right. So it's helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and probably ogdominium or whatever number 18, 118 is, but it doesn't stay around long enough for us to really know, but probably it, number 118 would also be included in the noble gases. So these have eight valence electrons. So if I'm an atom and I'm not a noble gas, I want to be like the noble gases. I want to copy them because they are considered stable. This is always the goal. So if I'm an element that's here, I'm going to do whatever I need to to act like I'm here. I can't change my protons. I can't change my neutrons. But what I could do is lose or gain or change my electrons. And that would give me the valence electrons that I want. If I'm here, I'm trying to get here. If I'm here, I'm trying to go backwards and get here. Whatever I need to do to get to this column as an element, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, why the noble gases? Why are they special? Well, remember, they have eight valence electrons. So they are already stable. They are considered in their lowest energy state. And like people, they want to be in the lowest energy possible. We sometimes say they're happy, but there's some chemists and teachers that don't like to use that word because it's not a science word. So stable is the official answer, but sometimes you'll hear it referred to as like they're happy, they're stable. They have the perfect number of valence electrons, no more, no less. 
And that means they don't want to combine or be with other atoms. They just want to hang out by themselves. That's where the term noble came from. All right, so if happy is the goal or stable is the goal, here's three things that an element can do to get stable. Elements can get stable if they lose electrons, so they get rid of the electrons or someone else takes their electrons or they gain electrons. Now, these have to go together. An element can't just lose to nowhere. An element can't just gain from nowhere. So these two go together. If something is gaining, it's because something else is losing. But if that can't happen, if no one's willing to lose electrons, that means no one can gain. So then they have to share electrons. That's an option too. So if you look at the periodic table, which groups on the periodic table would be easiest to do that? Well, there's a group on the far left that's called the alkali metals and a group on the far right called the halogens. Remember that this is the goal. This is the noble gas column. So why do you think these two groups, it's really easy for them to get stable? Look at where they are. That one, I'm trying to get here. This one, I'm trying to get here. So why would these be the easiest groups to be stable? Why? Well, because they only have to lose or gain one electron. And that doesn't take a lot of energy to change and move one electron. This group, if they lose one electron, they will be backwards in the noble gas column. If this group gains one electron, it'll go forward. It'll be in the noble gas column. So it doesn't take a lot of energy. So those are the two most reactive groups on the periodic table. Okay. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a second. The ele electron you said is tiny and doesn't have any, barely any mass, like it had super, it in, seems insignificant. So why is it so important? Well, let's talk about that. Why do you think? Why do you think it's the protons or in, in, it's the electrons instead of protons and neutrons that guide creating stability? Well, they're easier to deal with because one, they're not tangled up in the nucleus, right? So I don't have stuff in the, the, like I don't have to get through the electron cloud to get here. So they're not all tangled up in the gravity of the protons and the neutrons. The other thing is that it's the first thing that comes into contact with another element. If this is an element, these are the things on the outside. They're the front lines, right? So if they come in contact with another atom, it's the two electron clouds or electrons that will interact with each other. So that's the reason that it's the electron that guides atoms creating compounds. Okay. So we know why they get stable and we know they can gain, lose, and share, but how can they gain, lose, and share? All right. So how do they get happy? You can lose or gain or share electrons by, one, adding energy, because then that extra energy makes the electrons move more, and if they move more, they're more likely to go somewhere else. The kinds of energy, well, heat and light are your main kinds, or a chemical reaction could also produce heat and light, but I could put an atom next to a heat source or put it in a Bunsen burner, or I could shine light on it. That extra energy will allow those electrons to move. I could also, the second option is, if I put the electron, which is negative, close to something positive, that could also make it move. Think about what? What in an atom would be positive? Yeah, the nucleus, right? Or the proton specifically. The proton is in the nucleus. The nucleus is positive. So this nucleus, if it gets close enough, it can attract an electron to it, either pull it or actually take the electron into that other atom and create an ion. Remember those vocab words we learned about last time? So that is an option for making an electron move. So gaining and losing and sharing can happen because of ch energy changes and because of attraction changes. Okay, take a little pause because that's been a bunch of videos or video notes so far. And what I want you to do is I actually want you to do a level two question. So we're kind of like halfway through our notes. Think of it that way. So pause the video and write a level two question. Here's some cues if you need for level two. Otherwise, use your Costa question guide. A level two kind of question about any of our notes so far. Go ahead and pause. Take a moment to think. Get your brain active. And then come on back when you're ready. Okay, so now let's talk about this idea of what is a bond. Now, chemical bond, of course, is what we're focusing on, not James Bond, but ha, ha, ha. All right. Compounds form to make the elements stable. Okay, that's what we learned in the first half of our notes. Like their nearest noble gas in terms of eight valence electrons, that kind of thing. They can lose, gain, and share electrons. So they have eight valence electrons. This is all review. You don't have to write it down again. But when the electrons are either lost and gained to each other or shared between elements, those elements are held together by electric forces called 
bonds. That's the idea. So when you lose or gain electrons or when you're sharing electrons, that creates an electric attractive forces. Think like static electricity. So positives and negatives, that kind of electric attractive force is what I mean. And that is called a bond. That's what keeps the atoms together. And when they're together, that's when they create something more stable. So when let's focus on losing and gaining electrons first. When you lose and gain electrons, you create this vocab word called an ion. There are a couple versions of ions, but an ion is an atom with a charge. Well, you can, of course, have either a positive or a negative charge. So let's talk about those two options. If you lose an electron, think about that. Electrons are negative. Get rid of something negative, you become positive, right? Like if you get rid of a negative attitude, you're more positive. So if you lose an electron, it's instead of just ion, it's called a cat ion. Cat ion means you have less electrons than before. Now here's how you can remember it. Cats have paws. So a cat ion is positive. That's the way you can help yourself remember it. Why is it positive? Cat? Because it lost an electron and electrons are negative. Get rid of something negative, you're more positive. Generally on the periodic table, these are the metals. So there's the stair-step line. If you're looking at the periodic table I gave you, there's that stair-step line that starts between boron and aluminum and then goes to the right like stairs. All the elements on the left are metals. They are more likely to become a cation. If you gain electrons, that is known as an anion. So again, ions are some type of charge. Cation is positive, anion must be negative. Like when you have ants at your party, it's not as good as my positive cat, but it still works. So anions are negative, and generally these are the nonmetals. So these are the elements on the right hand side of that stair step line with like boron, carbon, silicon, those, and then going to the left. So those are the elements that are most likely to gain electrons to be stable. And then that creates a negative charge because electrons are negative. So if you've ever seen in Saturn ion, well, ions have charges, positives and negatives. So ions must be attractive cars. <laughs> There's a good little chemistry joke for you. All right. A little side note here. So when you lose and gain electrons and they connect and form a compound, that's an ionic bond. Definition of an ionic bond is in a force of electric attraction because of opposite charged ions that now create a new neutral particle. So that neutral particle is an ionic compound. It's a compound made of ions and they are referred to as formula units which yes, are abbreviated FUs. So if you're talking about a formula unit, you're talking about a compound that is made up of a opposite charged particles. The whole formula unit would be neutral because all the positive and negative charges are matching each other and attracting each other. So the formula unit is what you call an ionic compound ending result. So compound is a generic word for anytime atoms connect, Formula unit is specifically if it's ions that have created a neutral new particle. So for example, calcium and chlorine are both unstable on their own. However, calcium can lose electrons and chlorine can gain those electrons, or really it's chlorine is the thing taking the electrons from calcium. And so when those two things come together, they attract to form a neutral compound. Chlorine has gained electrons, so it's negative. Calcium has lost electrons, so it's positive. They come together and create a stable neutral compound called a formula unit. That's a little bit of the chemistry going on. All right, well, what about sharing electrons? These are referred to as molecules. So instead of a formula unit, formula unit is for ionic connections, ions that are attracting. Molecules are when we're sharing. Well, there's two different ways you can share. You can share because you have two atoms that are both holding on to the electrons and no one's willing to, sh to remove any, like a tug of war where two teams are perfectly matched and everyone's tugging on the rope. No one's willing to let go. It's not moving. That's a non-polar molecule. Equal sharing of electrons. A polar molecule, let's go back to that tug of war idea. So imagine that the rope is like the electrons and the two teams playing tug of war are like the two atoms. They're both holding on to the electrons. So in a perfectly matched tug of war game, that's equal sharing of electrons. That's a nonpolar molecule. So there's a connection there because they're both attracting both teams. Both atoms are attracting the electrons. 
If one team is a little bit stronger, you get what would be con uh, referred to as a polar molecule, unequal sharing. So this would be like one atom is a little bit stronger. So the nucleus is pulling those negative electrons a little closer to itself or a tug of war team that is pulling the rope, the ribbon in the middle, a little bit closer to its side, but is not strong enough to actually take the electrons or win the tug of war. So one team is, we think of one team or one element is kind of a bully due to that stronger nucleus, that positive attraction can pull the electrons a little bit so it's uneven. That's a polar molecule. So these are some vocab words that we're going to keep using as the, as the course goes on. So molecules, nonpolar, polar, all of this has to do with the strength of the nucleus trying to pull away the electrons, but it's not strong enough to actually take the electrons, so they have to share and create molecules instead of the ions that we just talked about. Instead of a positive and negative charge in a polar molecule, you create these partial positive and partial negatives, and we use this symbol. It's the Greek letter delta with a positive and negative rather than just a fully positive and negative charge, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. All right, so we've got some chemistry knowledge of sharing electrons and molecules, gaining and losing electrons and formula units. What I want to talk about last year, this little side note, will not last completely, but one last piece about molecules is they, when you have a molecule, it's made of covalent bonds. And the definition of a covalent bond is a bond that forms between atoms when they are sharing. These are referred to as molecules, which we already talked about. A compound, a molecule is a compound formed when covalent bonds are created. The nucleus of atom one in the molecule is attracted to the electrons of the other atom in the electron and that cre in the molecule and that creates a connection that connection is the covalent bond the result is called a molecule so for example chlorine is unstable by itself but it f f finds another chlorine what can happen is, is you get two chlorines cl2 this chlorine has its own electrons this chlorine has its own electrons Right now, you can see there's seven for this chlorine and seven for this chlorine, but eight is the magic number. So if this chlorine says, hey, let's share a pair of electrons, I'm not strong enough to take that electron from you, so I have eight, but I can share one of them and then look, like a Venn diagram kind of, we have eight total, each of us, so now we're a stable molecule. This is a special group of atoms called a diatomic atom. So there are seven diatomics where this just happens naturally. You don't really ever just have a Cl all by itself. You have chlorine two, diatomic. The other elements that do that are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, iodine, bromine, and chlorine. So these are the seven diatomics. If you look at where they are on the periodic table, if you look at where nitrogen is, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, it kind of makes a seven on the periodic table, only that's only six of them. The seventh is hydrogen, which is way over on the other side, the first element on the periodic table. So diatomics is just a special version of a molecule that's made of two of the same element that's so unstable, you can never just have an H. You can never just have an I. It's either a diatomic iodine or iodine would be in some other compound like sodium iodide or something like that. All right. So that's a little side note about molecules and then this special thing called the seven diatomics. Okay, time to pause again. So you've got a couple options. Either write two level one questions or one level three question just to kind of help you take a pause, get active and your brain involved, take a little break from writing and think about a question and then write the question. All right, come on back when you're ready. Let's finish this up. The last thing we got to talk about is oxidation number. An oxidation number is a positive or negative number that is assigned to an element showing how many electrons it needs to lose or gain to be like its nearest noble gas. Remember, noble gases are what we're always comparing to to see if an atom is stable or not. And if it's not stable, we can figure out its oxidation number, and then that tells us what does it need to do to be stable. Let's practice this. So how do we figure out an oxidation number? Well, it's kind of think of the periodic table like a game board. You count forward and backward the squares, 
just like you would on a game board until you get to the noble gas column. You do whatever is closer. So you, it's a game board where you can go backward or forward. It does whatever is closer. But I do need to tell you, so write this on your periodic table. The oxidation number of hydrogen happens to be plus one. I know that seems weird because you can't go backwards from hydrogen, but that's why I'm giving it to you. Hydrogen, it works because of the fact that hydrogen always exists, pure hydrogen as H2. So it's got an extra electron that it can get rid of. So just know that the oxidation number of hydrogen is plus one. All right. Now, once you figure out an oxidation number, those elements come together so that the ad, adding up all the oxidation numbers, the sum of oxidation numbers equals zero. So if you have a plus two, you either have to have a negative two or two negative ones, because that adds up to negative two, to make a stable compound. Or if you had a plus three and a minus two, you would have to have another plus three to equal six and three negative twos to equal negative six so that the oxidation numbers add up to zero. Uh, speaking of zero, um, oh, what did zero say to eight? What did zero say to eight? There's the picture. Nice belt. <laughs> All right. Just a chance to t take a little break and have a little fun. All right. Not that we're having, we're having fun the whole time. I know we are, but a little random fun. Here we go. Let's do some eggs samples, examples together. All right. Put this in your notes on an output page. Let's practice this a little bit. How would the following elements combine to make their oxidation number equal to zero? All right. So how many of each do we need? So for example, sodium, if you look on the periodic table, has a plus one charge and iodine has a negative one charge. So sodium with a plus one and iodine with a minus one, they would come together and you'd have one of each of them. Calcium has a plus two charge and chlorine has a negative one charge. So that means that calcium with the plus two and chlorine with the minus one, I would need two chlorines to balance out the positive two on calcium. Sodium is a plus one. Oxygen is a minus two. So if sodium is plus one and oxygen is minus two, I would need two sodiums to balance out the negative two in oxygen. Hydrogen, remember I told you it's plus one. Bromine is minus one. So hydrogen plus one and bromine minus one are a perfect match already. So hydrogen and bromine would just connect and make a stable compound. Magnesium is a plus two and chlorine is a minus one. So Mg plus two, chlorine minus one. You would need two chlorines, which would add up to negative two, to balance out the positive two on magnesium. So to summarize what we just practiced, all that stuff. Atoms combine because they want to be like their nearest noble gas in terms of eight valence electrons. There are a few exceptions to that octet rule, boron, beryllium, lithium, helium, hydrogen. Those early elements on the periodic table, why are they exceptions? They're just so small, their baby nucleus can't hold on to eight electrons. So that's not something you need to memorize right now. I just want to acknowledge the fact that there are some exception, exceptions to that octet rule of eight valence electrons. Their nearest noble gas is helium. And it turns out that helium only has two valence electrons. So all of these elements would be okay with two valence electrons as their stable number. Whew, that brings us to the end of our second day of this unit. That's a lot of information about atoms combining and putting atoms together, oxidation numbers, molecules, formula units. It's a lot. So what I want you to do is to make sure that you have at least three Costa questions for today's notes. So go back and do any if you need to. And then write your summary for today's notes. There were three different um three different essential questions to answer. So your summary might be three sentences. That's okay. Um, but make sure that you're answering those EQs. What I also recommend you do, I don't have any new assignment because these notes were a lot. So to fill up your time, the rest of your time for our class time today, you should look at those unit practice problems. So remember, they're in the week one folder. You try the problems, put them in the back of your notebook, check the answers so you can see if this new stuff is making sense. The other thing I want to point out is if that you haven't already taken the unit one quiz 
or turned in your changes lab report, get that done today. So instead of doing this stuff, you know, maybe you do this stuff quick, but then also spend some time finishing up these two assessments from unit one so that over winter break, you don't have to do any homework. I don't want you to, I'm not assigning anything new. This new stuff today is meant to be getting done today during the time that you normally would work on about an hour on a Wednesday. So finish it up so that you don't have to do this stuff over winter break. So that means that's the end. That's the end of our time. Tomorrow is the start of winter break. So that means the next time I see you will be 2021. So happy er, early, happy new year to you. And the next time I will see you is at our next Zoom in January. Thanks so much for listening. Happy new year. We'll see you next time.